lives in Armenia, unless you go to Armenia, it's never going to happen. And I just sort of doggedly kept writing for this guy. And one day I got a phone call from a friend of mine, Michael Brook, who said, oh, you know, Jivan's going to be in Los Angeles. And it was just sort of, you know, I, I just kept writing because I knew, you know, like, like, if you build it, he will come. I just kept doing this. And, and it was great because he doesn't speak a word of English. Um, he is, you know, he's a god in his own country. He, he has his own vodka named after him. And if you drink enough of this vodka, um, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the ice will melt and his face is on the inside of the label. You'll actually get to see his face. And so our communication, of course, was drinking vodka until we could see his face and him, him playing like a god. Don't die. They'll feed you to the lions. They're worth more than we are. Th this first chain fight, I mean, it's it's pretty out there, you know. I mean, I, I think the music will frighten the children, let alone the images. But the idea was that you go from this incredible ethnic, percussive, tribal thing into this sort of beautiful thing of actually getting into Rome because, you know, the two scenes really flow from one into the other. So the two parts of the empire actually are linked. When I, when, I, when I first looked at what Ridley had done with, with Rome, I suddenly realized, you know, that this was really a Lady Riefenstahl homage to Rome. And so I shamelessly put on my German hat and, and went into the Soft Wagner territory. Actually, literally from that first day in England, um, a, a couple of things happened. First of all, sitting in that tent and, and saying to Ridley, hang on a second, this is supposed to be a battlefield. He's, Marcus Aurelius, he's got all this great furniture here, he's got all these amazing works of art around. You know, this can't be real. And Ridley said, no, 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 come on. He was here for 16 years fighting these battles. He would have had, you know, he would have brought all the things he needs as an emperor to have around him. And I was suddenly starting to think about how formal, how gracious, how civilized Rome was. And then, you know, and, and we were looking at Roman architecture, we were looking at books of, you know, Rome, and, uh, and it's, a, it's this civilized, it's this formalized thing where I suddenly thought, but at the same time, it's all built on blood, it's all built on savagery, it's all built on the back of slaves. And I was thinking, how can I write a piece of music that has that sort of duality in it? And one of the things Ridley always lets me do, he lets me be crazy. So, so I had this idea that all the action sequences should be waltzes. You know, like a Viennese waltz. You can't think of anything more fluffy and civilized and such a beautiful form. Everything is just so and perfect. And I thought, what if I take the shape, the form of a waltz and just make them bloody, savage and brutal? I actually, you know, I, I talked to Ridley about this, you know, that, that you had this perfect form as so, well, you know, the way Roman architecture is so perfect and so rounded, and that, that the music would do the same thing, but at the same time always speak to your sort of darkest, nastiest <laughs> instincts. It went really well for the first three seconds, and I suddenly realized, well, an impossible task I had set myself. But I just sort of kept persevering and I wrote this huge sort of what we called the gladiator waltz. And it literally, you know, it was all these action scenes just kept in waltz time. And I sent it over to Pietro and he started cutting the action scenes to it. It was really nice how the music and the images kept coming together even before they finished shooting and how we could sort of inspire each other. And the 
the dastardly experiment was actually starting to work out. Because you look, there's no point doing working on a movie like Gladiator and not taking risks and not going out there, not being reckless. And then of course, the other thing was because he delivered such a huge canvas to me, um, I I could go both ways. I could throw enormous forces at the at the images, or I could stay very small, very insidious. And, you know, because the images are large, and I got away with playing actually very soulful, very emotional, slow music against large images, because the images would be, you know, I was using them like the rest of my orchestra, basically. When we, when we got to Carthage, we really had to, you know, the Carthage battle, which is the first time we really see a battle within the Colosseum in Rome, we better, we better pay off the expectations. And it's a, com it's a complicated scene because it's, it's all about strategy, it's all about military speak and stuff like this. And, and it's, an, it's a noisy scene as well. And, and I, I noticed that the audience wasn't really, you know, a test screen wasn't really following what Maximus was trying to do with his troops. And so part of what, what it became about for me was to try to explain the strategy musically so you really understood, okay, here are the good guys and they're not doing this and here this is happening. And we, we kept previewing the movie with my temp versions of these pieces in. And I could actually use the reaction from the audience all the time and refine them and refine them and refine them until you really noticed you know, the audience was getting it, everything was very clear, and at the same time it was incredibly exciting. And it's sort of great that when in a movie I can actually use my language, which I think of course is incredibly articulate and far more articulate than these words that we're using all the time, to really get to the, get to the heart of things and really actually use it instead of an exposition scene. And again, I mean, it, it used, I mean, Pietro had again cut it all to be the infamous gladiator waltz. So, so now we had a structure and now I could move very freely within that. There's something great about going to previews and seeing and just being within an audience that didn't know what to expect and suddenly that scene comes on and you just knock their socks off. You never want to be caught at it. You never want to be caught at the idea. You just want people to feel that maybe there is some thought going on, but you know, let, let them work it out themselves. And I know when we were recording it in London, the, you know, the, the orchestra played amazingly well and because they suddenly realized what I was doing and they knew that I needed blood and guts from them and they gave me blood and guts. Hey, 